Hello, my name is Katherine Agnes Heather, and I'm an educator, a violinist, a critical theorist, a scholar, a musicologist, but most of all, a human who wishes to enact real change. I am currently in the final year of completing my PhD in historical ethnomusicology at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities with a dissertation on sound and Holocaust memorialization. Before we begin the viewing, I would like to take a moment to speak about the music you are about to hear in Garden of the Righteous. First, note that the melodies are original works composed in the style of klezmer music representative of Yiddish culture. Klezmer music still rings out in Central and Eastern Europe, albeit from predominantly non-Jewish sources. Walking around Kizmiris, the old Jewish quarter in Krakow, Poland, musicians are heard playing in the square. And on a bus tour of Berlin, Germany, distinctly Jewish music rings from the guide headphones to alert tourists to areas of significant Jewish history. Museums, monuments, and memorials referencing the Holocaust or Jewish culture are present all across Europe. It may come as a shock to reconcile why, more than half a century after the Holocaust, in countries where Jews now make up just a tiny fraction of the population, products of the Jewish culture, or at least what is perceived as Jewish culture, have become very viable components of the popular public domain. There is a distinctly visible and growing Jewish presence in Europe, yet without a significant presence of living Jews. Scholar Ruth Ellen Gruber refers to this phenomenon as virtually Jewish, and it derives from needs for historical preservation, heritage, and of course, commercialization and tourism. Klezmer music is one of the most significant markers of a culture that was almost destroyed during the Holocaust, preserved and revived by survivors of the Shoah. In turn, we are fortunate to have old recordings, manuscripts, and studies by ethnomusicologists that date back to the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Klezmer music, like most folk traditions, was never parochial. It was passed down orally and shared freely, not only within its own society and group, but between Jews and non-Jews alike. Ultimately, for a folk tradition to survive, it must regenerate and create new repertoire that both preserves the genre and adds a new and unique voice to it, just as Judith Gudel Eisner has done. Judith has been studying and teaching the art of Yiddish klezmer music for nearly the entire time she has been on the faculty of MacPhail Center for Music since 1986, and has studied with world-renowned experts in Yiddish culture, fiddle style, dance, language, and history. Nice, see, that's better. Understanding how Yiddish music functioned in pre-Holocaust Ashkenazic culture, primarily in weddings, became a focus of her study. The music which she composed for Garden of the Righteous, which is performed by Nye Strunas, reflects her deep love, passion, and connection to her own roots. Her music also reflects the poignant emotions of the stories in Garden of the Righteous. When asked to discuss her feelings about the Holocaust, Judith, like many people, finds herself at a loss for words. And yet, she says, music provides a way for her to speak where language fails. In today's world's world of ethnic unrest, racism, rising anti-Semitism, and a fractured social and political system, music schools such as MacPhail are acutely aware of how vital it is to nurture, teach, and share all genres of music with their students. Partnerships in which MacPhail faculty members and guest artists from diverse backgrounds reach out to students around the Twin Cities are examples of important work being done right now and are models of still more work to come. We would like to thank Peter Reichliff from Eastside Freedom Library, the University of Minnesota's Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, and Dennis Peter from the Unitarian Society of Menominee, Wisconsin, for support of tonight's premiere performance. I ask you to open your ears and listen to both the history and music that is presented in Garden of the Righteous. Take it in, for any music or history is just meaningless noise if we don't open our minds and hearts to listen. To our program today. It's called Garden of the Righteous. We're Naya Strunas, which is Yiddish for New Strings. We're a klezmer quartet based in the Twin Cities of Minnesota. 
will play original compositions which were inspired by a genre of klezmer music for string instruments. This type of music was cherished for centuries by Ashkenazic Jews of Eastern Europe, but it was nearly wiped out by the Holocaust. Today, it is making a comeback by many bands such as ours. On today's program, we will be joined by guests who will share true stories of courageous individuals who risked their lives to save victims of the Holocaust, both Jews and non-Jews alike. We are also joined by a representative of Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders. Many people are surprised to learn that during the Holocaust, there were hundreds of thousands of ordinary people just like us from around the world who acted on their moral convictions to save innocent people. Out of that significant number, over 27,000 of them have been designated Righteous Among the Nations by Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial Center in Jerusalem. Trees have been planted in their honor in the Garden of the Righteous for the inspiration of all visitors to the center. Between Stories will play music, providing you time to reflect on a universal question that we, the narrators, and you, the listeners, continue to ponder. Would I have the courage to help others in great danger, knowing that my involvement would jeopardize not only my life, but the lives of my family? Baruch Sharoni, who is a member of the committee at Yad Vashem that recognizes the righteous, answered the question this way. He said, I see these people as true noble souls of the human race. When I meet them, I feel somewhat inferior to them, for I know that had I been in their place, I wouldn't have been capable of such deeds. And Maya Angelou, the great African-American poet, whose life itself was an embodiment of courage, said that courage is the most important of all the virtues, because without courage one cannot practice any other virtue with consistency. And Golda Meir, the fourth Prime Minister of Israel, had this to say, The Jewish people remember not only the villains, but also every small detail of the rescue attempts. The righteous rescued not only the lives of Jews, but saved hope and faith for us all in the human spirit. During our program, we'll hear a representative of Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, which is a humanitarian organization of over 43,000 medical and logistical staff. Like the righteous of the past, the people of Doctors Without Borders say victims of war, epidemic, and natural disaster, regardless of their ethnicity, politics, or religion. So I want to take this opportunity to thank you, our listeners, for staying with us during the program. We value your comments and support of our project. To date, we have raised over $11,000 for Médecins Sans Frontières, through live performances in Minnesota. We met our original goal of $10,000 and raised it now to $20,000. And with your help, we will surely get there. Imre Bateri was a Hungarian farmer living alone in Chepel near Budapest after he had sent his family members to a quiet town in the countryside because of bombing raids. One day, Bateri was riding on a passenger train heading toward Budapest when Hungarian police boarded the train and began checking the passengers' papers. He saw a young man sitting in the coach become visibly alarmed by the approaching officers and correctly guessed that he was a Jew. The man had reason to fear because Jews were not allowed to travel by train due to an anti-Jewish decree. 
Luckily for him, as the officers were nearing the young man's seat, an air raid forced the train to stop and all the passengers took cover. When the bombing stopped and everyone got back on board, Bahari took a seat opposite the young man and whispered, I know you were a Jew in trouble. Don't worry, I'll help you. Bahari calmly presented his documents to the officers and said that the young man opposite him was his son who had forgotten his papers at home. They believed him and moved on. Bahari learned that the young man he saved was Martin Wiesel, a Jew who had escaped from his home in the eastern part of the country to find a safer place to live in Budapest. Bahari hid Martin in his home in Chepel. Later, he also hid Martin's uncle, Shaul, and some friends of Shaul's. Bahari could have been shot for harboring Jews. Some Hungarians even acted as whistleblowers and reported people like Bahari to the authorities. But despite the personal risk, Bahari provided them with food and all their other needs, telling his neighbors that his guests were family members whose home had been destroyed by the bombing. When one of the refugees was wounded by a stray bullet, Bahari took her by horse-drawn wagon to a German doctor, telling him that she was a relative. The doctor believed Bahari's story, removed the bullet, and saved her life. Bahari was an ordinary man, a farmer. You might wonder what inspired him to take such risks to protect people he didn't even know. Different people have different motivations, and in Bahari's case, it was religious conviction which led him to oppose Nazi policies towards the Jews. He said, I was only a vessel through which the Lord's purpose was fulfilled. When I stand before God on Judgment Day, I shall not be asked the question posed to Cain. Where was he when his brother's blood was screaming to God? On November 20th, 1986, Yad Vashem recognized Imre Bahari as righteous among the nations. Franciscus Weinacker was born in 1908 and his wife Hermina van der Kolweik in 1913. Franz and Mien, who were devout Roman Catholics from large families, married in 1936 and had four young children. 
They lived in the Dutch town of Dieden, 50 miles southeast of Amsterdam. Franz was a grain miller, but also sold meat and eggs. And through this side business, when the Netherlands was conquered and occupied by Nazi Germany, he was identified as being a part of the food distribution system, and so had more leeway in traveling around, including being out at night after curfew. In the spring of 1943, Franz was in Amsterdam delivering produce when a doctor friend asked him to take a girl to stay with his family in Dieden for a while so that she could have fresh air and better nutrition. The girl was Freitje de Groot, whose real name was Schulamit Laub from Mainz, Germany. She and her five siblings had been left at the Dutch border in December 1938 by their father, who had been imprisoned in Buchenwald but released and told to get his family out of Germany by January 1st. They had no place to go as a family in any other countries, but at this particular time, the Dutch government was willing to take in a few thousand unaccompanied Jewish children. The Laub children never saw their parents again, but they were safely together in Amsterdam, living in the homes of various Jewish families. Shula attended a Jewish day school and played with other neighborhood children, including a girl near her own age named Annelies Frank. But by June of 1940, the Netherlands was a conquered country. The Jews in Amsterdam were forced into ghettos, the first stop on a path that led to auschwitz birkenau or Sobibor. Some were able to go into hiding, like the Frank family who were hidden by members of Otto Frank's business, and like the Laub children who were saved by two women who had taught at the Jewish school. By the time Franz Weinecker met Freitje de Groot, and took her home to his family in Dieden. She had been hiding in a closet for many months. Freitje was the first of several children whom the Weinachers hid in their home. Soon there were two more, Freitje's brother Fritje and another girl, Agnes. In the fall of 1943, a Jewish couple, Louis and Engeline Bars, made it to Dieden from Amsterdam. Louis was the first adult to be hidden at the Weinacker farm and helped Franz design and build a hidden room that couldn't be identified by Nazi engineers searching the house. Engelein was housed in a nearby village with a young widow with two small children. The underground paid her to have Engelein live with her, and she was willing to do it, but her priest told her that Engelein had to go, that if the Germans found out there were Jewish people in the village, he as the shepherd of the flock would be killed and everyone would have to watch. So that night Engelein walked along the canal to the Weinacker house and was reunited with her husband. In the fall of 1943 and into 1944, the Weinacker household took in more Jews in hiding. Some stayed only a night or two till Franz could transport them to another safe house, but others stayed, and before long there were usually eight and often ten extra people living there. Franz was intimately involved with the Dutch underground, ferrying people around by night and arranging for extra food for people who were sheltering fugitives. In October 1943, a tearful Engelein Bars told Franz that she was pregnant. She was afraid that she would have to leave and had nowhere to go, but with the support of the underground and the firm commitment of Franz and Mien, she stayed. Over the course of that winter, Greet Weinacker began wearing increasingly larger pillows under her clothing, pretending to be pregnant. On February 10, 1944, in a convent in the nearby town of Ravensbrück, a baby girl was born. Engelein and the baby stayed at the convent for a few days, then went home to the Weinacker house. Mien Weinacker stayed home for a week as if she had just given birth. The baby was named Ina Franziska Cory Weinacker, registered by Franz as his daughter. Not only was she safe from deportation, but she was eligible for food allotments and health care. By the end of the war, 10 extra people at a time had lived in the Weinacker house, and at least 14 others had passed through it. That doesn't count the people Franz accompanied on trains and transported in the middle of the night, bringing them safely from one place to another because he knew the layout of the dikes and canals. The source of this information is the book Two Among the Righteous Few 
by Marty Brownstein. His wife, Leah, is the baby who was born in the Ravensbrück convent, acknowledged by the Weinachers as their own child, so that her life could be saved. This story is a reminder of all the many unnamed people who helped, who did the right thing as far as they were able. Everyone in the town of Dieden knew what was going on at the Weinacher farm. When baby Inaki was born, the doctor and the nurses and the nuns and the priest all knew whose daughter she really was. Franz's mother also sheltered children at her home. Everyone knew and no one ever told the Nazis, even though by keeping silent, they were risking their own lives and the lives of their families. Holocaust historian Martin Gilbert writes that in almost every instance where a Jew was saved, more than one non-Jew was involved in the act of rescue, which in many cases took place over several years. He cites Holocaust researcher Elizabeth Maxwell, who wrote of the French experience. It required 10 or more people in every case, and that takes no account of all those who were in the know or closed their eyes and did not talk. In August 1983, Franz and Mien Weinacker were honored as righteous among the nations. Mien had passed away in 1980, but Franz was able to go to Yad Vashem for the ceremony.
Hello, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. My name is Karen Stewart. I have worked off and on for the past 16 years with Doctors Without Borders, also known worldwide as Medicine Sans Frontières, or simply by our French acronym, MSF. In my time with MSF, working as a mental health officer, I've gone on 11 assignments in nine countries across Africa and Asia. Most recently, I was working in Uzbekistan with a tuberculosis project. Now, generally when I go out, I go for one year, and then I come home to the USA for about two or three months and rest, and then back out to a new country for another year. As a kid, I lived overseas, and I traveled throughout Europe and Asia. My parents took me to places like Dachau, where I witnessed the cruel realities of humanity. I think by visiting places like Laos, Thailand, Russia, I really saw a world outside the comfort of middle-class America. As an adult, in 2004, I had worked in the field of mental health in the United States for more than 15 years in hospital and community-based settings. I'd earned a master's degree in social work and became a licensed clinical social worker. It was my dream to take my mental health skills and degrees to work with people in other cultures dealing with emergency and crisis. So that's what I did. I applied to MSF because of its principles of independence, impartiality, and neutrality. I also knew in the field I would be able to focus my energy on mental health work, knowing that all my other needs would be taken care of by other team members, all doing their part. So drivers, cooks, cleaners, doctors, nurses, interpreters, logistic experts, administrators. Something that's actually not known about MSF is 45% of the staff in the field are non-medical. It takes a lot behind the scenes. Another important piece is 90% of the staff are hired locally. So when you think of me out there working as a mental health officer, I'm actually not the one seeing the patients. I'm managing a team of locally hired staff. It makes total sense. They're the ones who know the language, they know the culture, they live in the community. Whatever is happening to our patients, if it's violence, HIV, malaria, it's happening to our staff. One of the main reasons I've continued to work with MSF all these years is the locally hired staff. So my job was to provide clinical supervision, professional guidance, and training to the team. Working with a myriad of teams and people throughout our programs has taught me that as a manager, the top skills I must bring are flexibility and sensitivity. It's important to know that field workers with MSF, like me, are simply ordinary people doing good work. I relate to Richard Leader's mantra, the purpose of life is to live a life of purpose. I do believe we're all interconnected. We are seeing this right now played out across the world as all of us deal with the same pandemic of COVID-19. For me, this time we're living in right now is reminiscent of the HIV AIDS crisis in terms of fear of the virus and the potential for social isolation and loneliness. I'm reminded of my first assignment, 2004-2005, working in Lagos, Nigeria, at our HIV AIDS Comprehensive Care Clinic. When I got there, there were 100 patients taking HIV medication. The goal, in one year's time, was to have 1,000 patients on HIV medication, access for all. We made it and saved lives. MSF showed that you can treat HIV patients successfully in low resource settings. Let me give you a cost comparison. In 2004, one person, one month HIV medication cost $1,000. Now in 2020, one person, one month, same medication, $100. That is due in part, thank you to the MSF access campaign. So this is an advocacy campaign that was actually born out of the prize money of the Nobel Peace Prize that we received in 1999. And it is based on the belief 
that access to health, including medicines, is a matter of justice, not charity. The Access Campaign right now is very active and quite vocal in relation to COVID-19. We at MSF are calling that there be no patents, no monopolies, and no profiteering from this pandemic. I would like to thank the incredible dedication and phenomenal fundraising efforts of Naya Strunis. Your support is what makes it possible for MSF to provide emergency medical care where the needs are the greatest. To donate to this campaign and performance, please visit tinyurl.com forward slash G-O-T-R-4, four, the numeral four, M-S-F. Let me spell that. T-I-N-Y-U-R-L dot C-O-M forward slash capital letters G O T R numeral four M S F. Use the donate button, watch the thermometer rise. Thank you for getting involved and standing with us. I am pleased to be able to tell you the story of Lily Woost. This story highlights the personal courage of a woman who made a choice to value love over her personal position and privilege. Prior to the rise of the Nazis, Germany was the most progressive country in the world, with Berlin in particular emerging as a hotbed of a nascent movement to decriminalize homosexuality and increase social spaces opening up where gay, lesbian, and trans individuals could express themselves. All of this came to a horrible end during the Nazi regime, resulting in the imprisonment and death of an estimated 15,000 gay men. Although lesbians were largely not arrested and killed by the Nazis. Lily Wust took the risks she did because of her love for another woman, a woman whose Jewishness and political activities made her a target. Lily Wust was a married mother, honored by the Reich as the wife of an officer and the mother of four sons. Residing in Berlin with her four children and a housekeeper during the early 1940s while her husband was away at war. Wust was introduced by that housekeeper to a woman named Felice Schragenheim, who also went by the name Felice Schroeder. After spending time together and falling deeply in love, Wust learned that Schragenheim was in need of protection from the Nazi authorities due to her status as a member of the German resistance and as a Jewish woman. The couple had begun living together after Wust legally separated from her husband in 1942. They remained a couple until July 1944, when Schragenheim was reported to Nazi officials and captured by the Gestapo. Prior to falling in love with Felice, Lily Wust had not been particularly political and in fact had benefited greatly from the Nazis. This changed after she fell in love with a Jew. After Felice was arrested at the home she shared with Wust and taken to a transit and then a concentration camp, Wust did everything she could to protect her lover, using her privilege to arrange deliveries of warm clothing and extra food and making visits when possible. However, on October 9, 1944, Schragenheim was transported to the Auschwitz concentration camp after being sentenced to death. She is believed to have died on New Year's Eve 1944, according to Yad Vashem historians, who have stated that Wust had only been able to escape punishment for hiding Schragenheim in her home because she was the mother of four young children whose father was missing in action. As a result of her involvement with Felice, Lily faced increased scrutiny and harassment by Nazi officials and was required to check in with local police every two days. But this increased danger only strengthened her resolve to shield other women at risk of similar fate. After meeting Lucie Freelander, Katja Larsenstein, and Dr. Rosen Ohlendorf three weeks before Christmas in 1944, Wust then began hiding these three women in an upper level of her Berlin home. 
All three of these women went on to survive the war. Interviewed in 2001, the 89-year-old Lily Woost recalled her time with Felice. It was the tenderest love you could imagine. She was my other half, literally my reflection, my mirror image, and for the first time I found a love, aesthetically beautiful and so tender. Twice since she left, I've felt her breath and a warm presence next to me. I dream that we will meet again. I live in hope. More than 60 years after the death of her beloved Felice, Lily Woos died at the age of 92 in 2006. In 1994, a book about the story was published called Amy and Jaguar, A Love Story, Berlin, 1943. It was then adapted for the screen, becoming the 1999 film Amy and Jaguar. In 1995, Elizabeth Wust was declared righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem for her efforts to shield Jewish women from Nazi persecution. In 1940, in the Jewish ghetto of Nazi-occupied Warsaw, a clandestine scholarly organization called Oinig Shabbos was called together by the historian Emanuel Ringelblum. For three years, over 60 members worked in secret to chronicle the daily lives of hundreds of thousands of ordinary people as they endured starvation, disease, and deportation by the Nazis. Shortly before the Warsaw Ghetto was emptied and before being totally destroyed in 1943, over 17,000 documents were buried in milk cans and tin boxes, including personal diaries, artwork, music and songs, poetry, stories, letters, birth certificates, newspapers, flyers, photographs, official notices issued by the Nazis, and lots more. The retrieval of this massive archive, known only to three survivors, is a heart-rending story in and of itself. But most importantly, Oinik Shabbos is a portrayal of a complex and highly nuanced culture which grappled with the knowledge of its own impending extinction. It allows us to view history through the eyes of those who lived and suffered rather than from the perspective of the Nazis. Oinik Shabbos which in Yiddish translates to the joy of the Sabbath, is a chronicle of courage, resilience, and resistance to oppression. 
Its importance for us today is its universal call for the creation of a better future. Irena Sendler was born on the outskirts of Warsaw, Poland in 1910. Her father, who was a physician, was known for his dedication to the city's underserved population. Her family was Catholic, but as a child, Sendler grew up playing with both Jewish and Catholic friends and was influenced by her father's commitment to serving the poor. In 1932, Sendler became a social worker at the Mother and Child Assistance Division of the Free Polish University in Warsaw. She conducted outreach in Warsaw's most impoverished neighborhoods, visiting homes and connecting single mothers to financial and legal services. When the Mother and Child Division closed down, Sendler and many of her colleagues were transferred to the Warsaw Department of Social Welfare. When Nazi Germany invaded Poland in 1939, Sendler was in charge of delivering aid for the Social Welfare Department. She delivered free meals, clothing, and financial assistance to those in need through distribution points around the city. As the Nazi pogroms and violence intensified, she and a few of her colleagues in the department began to funnel aid through the same channels to Jews in Warsaw who were denied these services and who faced increasingly deadly persecution. Sendler would fill out false aid applications for Jewish families, giving them Polish surnames, so they too could receive food and medicine. The Nazis soon began forcibly relocating Polish Jews to an area within the city that became known as the Warsaw Ghetto. When the Warsaw Ghetto was sealed off in 1940, close to half a million people were detained inside an area the size of 16 city blocks. They received little to no food rations and were subject to extreme cold, hunger, and disease. Overcrowding, malnutrition, and poor sanitary conditions within the ghetto soon led to widespread starvation and high mortality. Ordinary Polish citizens were prohibited from entering the Warsaw Ghetto, just as Polish Jews inside were prevented from leaving. However, as a social worker with the Warsaw Department of Public Health, Irena Sendler obtained a pass to enter the ghetto through official checkpoints, ostensibly to assess for the presence of typhus which Nazis feared would spread outside the ghetto walls. Traveling back and forth every day, Sendler used her access to reestablish contacts and continued to clandestinely distribute food and medicine to people inside the ghetto. Irina Sendler was a mother herself and was passionate about children's welfare, and she saw the particularly dire conditions for the growing numbers of orphaned children inside the ghetto. Sendler began risking her own safety to smuggle them out. This dangerous work was aided by a small group of Sendler's trusted colleagues from the social welfare department. With the help of her fellow social workers, some of whom she knew from her days at the Free Polish University, Sendler organized a network of Polish families, convents, and orphanages who were willing to offer sanctuary. The Nazi regime punished any Polish citizens who aided Jews with execution and Sendler and her collaborators faced certain death if they were found out. Sendler placed the children, including infants, inside ambulances and other vehicles traveling through the checkpoints. They were hidden inside bundles of goods, suitcases, or toolboxes, or even smuggled out under clothing. Babies were sometimes sedated to keep them from crying. The children were sometimes taken out through underground passageways or through a church with a secret back door that led to the Polish side. These operations were conducted under the noses of Gestapo troops patrolling the ghetto at great risk to those involved. 
Once they made it to the Polish side, the children were given new Polish names and handed off to families and convents across Poland, their Jewish heritage erased to keep them safe from persecution. Systematic mass deportations began in earnest in 1942, and in the span of a few months, more than 265,000 people were forcibly moved from the Warsaw Ghetto to the gas chambers at Treblinka. At the same time, the Polish underground cell called Zygota was formed to help the remaining Jewish population escape. Sendler joined Zygota under the code name Yolanta and began smuggling as many children as she could out of the ghetto. Jewish parents inside the ghetto, facing an impossible choice, agonized over giving up their children to Irena, knowing that they would lose their Jewish identity and face an uncertain future. Can you guarantee they will live? The distraught parents asked Irena. But she could only guarantee that they would most likely die if they stayed. To remember each child's true identity, Sendler wrote their Jewish and Polish names on sheets of paper and buried these in jars in her neighbor's garden. Sendler was arrested by the Gestapo in 1943 under suspicion of underground activity. She was imprisoned, tortured, and sentenced to death for her activity with Zygota, but underground colleagues bribed her way out at the last minute. When she was released, she went into hiding and continued to work with Zygota for the remainder of the war. All in all, she had helped almost 2,500 children escape. After the war was over, Irena Sendler unearthed the jars from her garden and attempted to find the children and reunite them with their families but few family members had survived. Irena Sendler was recognized by Yad Vashem in 1965 as one of the righteous among the nations for her courageous work. But for decades, her story remained largely unknown outside of Poland. That began to change in 1999, when a group of high school students from Uniontown, Kansas, working on a History Day project, came across a newspaper article that briefly mentioned her acts of courage. The students were intrigued and began to research Sendler's life and the Polish organization Zygota. The students wrote a play about Irena Sendler's life during the war and called it Life in a Jar after the buried pieces of paper containing the children's real names and the only link to their true identities. They began performing the play throughout Kansas and at the same time discovered that Sendler herself was still alive in her 80s and living in Warsaw. The students began a correspondence with Irena. The story of the students and Irena Sendler became national news, and the students were eventually able to travel to Poland with their teacher to meet Irena in person. Irena Sendler received international recognition and numerous awards for her efforts during the war that saved the lives of so many children. Documentaries and a feature film were made about her experiences. She lived to be 98 years old, and until the very end, she maintained that she was not a hero, that she had done what anyone would do, and she regretted that she couldn't have done more. One would think that a Japanese diplomat would be an unlikely hero 
in saving people from the Nazis. Life is strange, however, and here is another remarkable story about a man who went against his own government and lost everything in order to save other people. Even a hunter cannot kill a bird that flies to him for refuge. Samurai Proverb Chune Sugihara Chune Sugihara was born in 1900. He was unconventional in a society that prizes conformity. His mother was from a long line of the samurai warrior class, which practiced the Bushido Code, developed in the 9th century. The code basically comprises a complex set of Japanese values stressing duty, honor, dignity, and courage. This ethos follows the dominant religious teachings of Confucianism and Shintoism. Many who knew him believed Sugihara had the strong spirit of the samurai deep within him. He showed independence and courage at an early age. As a top student, his father insisted he become a doctor, but he wanted to travel, study languages, and immerse himself in literature. When forced to sit for the medical exam, he left the entire answer sheet blank. When he later became the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs for Japan in Manchuria in 1934, he resigned in protest of Japan's cruel treatment of the Chinese. In 1939, he was sent to Kaunas, Lithuania, ostensibly to run a one-man consulate. Because he spoke fluent German and Russian, he knew that his most important job was to gather intelligence about the Germans at the border and find out if and when they were going to attack Russia. This would free Japan from having to defend Manchuria. While there, he daily encountered thousands of Jews fleeing from German-occupied Poland. They had walked from Poland to Kaunas and stood outside his residence day and night, begging for visas to travel through the Soviet Union and on to Japan. While the world around him disregarded their plight, Sugihara was unable to ignore their desperation. Three times he cabled his embassy for permission to issue visas, and each time they forbade him to do so because the Japanese government had no money. He talked about this with his wife, Yukiko, and his children. The family decided that despite the inevitable damage to his career, he would defy his government. While most of the world saw throngs of desperate foreigners, Sugihara saw human beings and knew he could save them. Day and night, he toiled away by writing handwritten visas. He issued as many visas in a single day as were normally written in a month. Since all the visas were handwritten, Yukiko massaged his aching hands at night. When Japan closed down the Lithuanian embassy in 1940, he took all the stationery and the official government stamp with his name on it so that he could continue to write visas. When he finally had to leave, he gave the stamp to a refugee to forge more, and as his train pulled away from the platform, he literally threw visas out the window. In many cases, entire families traveled on a single visa. It is estimated that over 400,000 people are alive today because of his effort. After being dismissed from the foreign office, he worked at menial jobs. Then he worked for 16 years with a Japanese trading company in Moscow, leaving his wife and family in Japan. He never spoke about his wartime activities, even to his closest friends. In 1968, a survivor who worked at the Israeli embassy in Tokyo discovered him. He was recognized as Righteous Among the Nations in October 1984. Speaking of his motives, Sugihara said, You want to know about my motives, don't you? Well, it is the kind of sentiments anyone would have when he actually sees the refugees face to face, begging with tears in their eyes. He just cannot help but sympathize with them. Among the refugees, there were the elderly and women. They were so desperate that they went as far as to kiss my shoes. Yes, I actually witnessed such scenes with my own eyes. 
people in Tokyo were not united on a refugee policy. I felt it foolish to deal with them. So I made up my mind not to wait for their reply. I knew that somebody would certainly complain in the future, but I myself thought this would be the right thing to do. There is nothing wrong in saving many people's lives. If anybody sees anything wrong in the action, it is because something not pure exists in their state of mind. With the spirit of humanity, philanthropy, and neighborly friendship, I ventured to do what I did, confronting this most difficult situation. And for this reason, I went ahead with redoubled courage. Hello again, Karen Stewart speaking as a mental health officer, having worked with Doctors Without Borders off and on for the past 16 years, also known as Médecins Sans Frontières, or simply our French acronym, MSF. I'm often asked what brought me to do such work with MSF, and to answer that question, I want to take you back to 2002. That year, I received a phone call telling me that my sister, my only sibling had taken her life. I was shocked, devastated, actually shattered. Following year, filled with depression, even thoughts of my own suicide. And just as I was coming up in 2003, I suffered another significant family loss. It took time, but by 2004, I emerged with some level of acceptance and understanding of what had happened. And as cliche as it sounds, it truly showed me that life is short. So in that moment, I asked myself, if if my life ended tomorrow, have I done everything I want to do? And the answer came, no. What I really wanted to do was international humanitarian aid work. So I joined MSF. As a mental health officer, 
I've worked in a multitude of projects from HIV AIDS, tuberculosis, active and post-conflict, natural disaster, sexual and family violence, and man-made or human-induced disaster. An example of that would be the garment factory collapse, Rana Plaza, in Dhaka, Bangladesh, in 2013. I was part of the mental health team responding to the survivors of that collapse. Now, keeping in mind that 90% of the staff working in the field with MSF are locally hired, only 10% being international like myself, the teams I clinically supervised and managed in the field range from about 6 to 16 counselors. Many of the teams are made up of lay counselors. These are regular people who have previously little or no formal education or experience with mental health or counseling. And I had a wide range of counseling teams, from psychologists with master's degree to lay counselors. It would depend on the context, the project, and the culture, who was available to work on our teams. I want to share a success story from my time at our clinic in Papua New Guinea. We were addressing the family and sexual violence, including incest and rape which was happening at extremely high rates throughout the country. We were offering medical and counseling response. So this story is about a 14-year-old girl who had been raped on the only road that she could access her home. Now, when she first came to the clinic all by herself, she was very quiet and withdrawn. She told us she could barely bring herself to leave home and come to the clinic that she'd tried like five times before. And each time she would be overcome by fear, turn around and run home. I could see that this young girl was very motivated to move through this trauma. And the counselor was also motivated to learn an advanced intervention known as exposure therapy. Now exposure therapy includes having the patient move towards the fear in very small increments with the hope that the fear will diminish or completely disappear. The first step is having the patient visualize in her mind, walking down the road before the rape, feeling safe. Then what we have that young girl do is to physically, literally walk down the road, but with a large group of people to keep her safe, to help her reclaim that road. When she told her family and her community about what she was doing at the clinic, many joined it felt like the entire village came out with her that first walk to reclaim the road. We started to see a dramatic difference in this young girl's demeanor. She was standing taller, she was smiling, she was initiating interaction, even by the third visit. Again and again she walked this road with the support of other people, including her family, slowly establishing her sense of safety. After each time, she would meet with the counselor and I process her fears and her thoughts. Eventually, she was able to walk down that road confidently, powerfully, courageously, by herself, reclaiming the road to her home. In her last visit to the clinic, she was filled with enthusiasm and excitement. She looked and acted as you would expect a 14-year-old girl. As a team, we had kind of a quiet sense of celebration as we saw how much we were truly able to help this young girl. In Papua New Guinea, the team witnessed brutal cases of family and sexual violence daily. And this patient's journey felt like a much needed win. After seven years, when we were closing the project, we had also provided training for medical staff in all 28 of the different provinces throughout the country hoping that these services would become sustainable for years to come. I would like to thank the incredible dedication and phenomenal fundraising efforts of Naya Strunis for MSF. Your support is what makes it possible for MSF to provide emergency medical care where the needs are the greatest. To donate to this campaign and performance, please visit tinyurl.com slash go tr for msf t-i-n-y-u-r-l dot com c-o-m forward slash k 
capital letters, G-O-T-R, numeral 4, M-S-F. Use the donate button. Watch the thermometer rise. Thank you for getting involved and for standing with us. Thank mm-hmm. you.